Hello everyone, welcome to my first live stream. Today we are going to start a sequence of live streams to cover some technical content, some front-end development, especially um, some deep, deep low-level uh, technologies without uh, frameworks, like we are going to avoid using React or uh, Angular or anything like that. And that is going to be a really nice uh, way to us to, to share some content uh, and to learn how those frameworks actually work and how we can get value from them. Uh, my name is Lucas. I have been working in uh, software development for 15 years and I shifted to work in main front end part around 10 years ago. The main point uh, to understand isomorphic applications is actually to try to understand a little bit on how internet works behind the scenes. Drawing some diagrams is probably an interesting way to cover that. So internet was originally designed as a very um, request response, mainly based on HTML. So imagine you have a, you, you are some kind of a user with a browser and this the user as they try to access a system or something the browser will generate a request to the server that will process that request and will generate a response to the browser normally in html format okay so html format is a, a markup that uh, when sent to the browser the browser is able to generate a view for that so the user can see the result of the rendering of that html and as the user interact with this page, clicking a button, submit a form, other requests are sending to the, uh, sent to the server and the server returns a, new, a full page again in HTML. So basically the internet was designed to have a, this very request response based on, on HTML and the, this HTML was always a full page. So the browser would have always a full page refresh, throw away everything that was there before and get a total new content displayed. And one of the problems in this approach is because that those HTMLs, all those pages, they had a lot of repetitive content, like header, footer, menus, and things like that, repetitive every time in the entire navigation of that user. And that was, especially earlier 2000s, was wasting a lot of network traffic on sending repetitive content. Then uh, the uh, internet evolved, especially with the, the uh, computers with a better CPU, better networks, or be better browser engines and things. And we slowly started writing some JavaScript that could run in the browser side. And that's where single page applications started getting more popular. And we started transferring a lot of that uh, execution that used to happen in the server now happens in the browser. So now, nowadays, the single page application is a very common format. And the way that that, that works is you still have the same user, the same browser. In the very first request, you still rely on a HTML page in the same way, but this HTML page tends to be a very, very small thing, uh, page that normally has only a reference to a JavaScript file. And then you transfer those two things to the browser and that works almost as if you are downloading an application, an app for your phone. And that JavaScript running in the browser now is the one that organizes the communication from that moment on. And then requests are sent to the server. The server would send the response, but now that response would no longer be in HTML. That would be normally in a JSON format. So this JSON format tends to be very small, a very small fragment of data that is transferred back to the browser. And then only small parts of the page would be updated as the user interacts with the page. So you no longer need to uh, do a full page reload again. You would only uh, update those small fragments as the user interacts. And that tends to be a very good navigation. After, after you have uh, this installation, uh, this download, this, from this point after, the, the experience for the users in, a, in, a, in this format tends to be better. But the problem on that is until that, uh, that point, like why you are still downloading this first HTML, this JavaScript, or the first JSON call, the user has nothing to see in the page. So that's, that's why normally single page applications, they tend to have a, some type of a loading animation or something to give the user the feeling until this first 
content is displayed. So that's that's the trade-off. So when, when we are talking about a server-side render comparing to browser-side, the server-side tends to be a really good first load. Like the feeling that you type a UR, uh, the URL and press enter and something is visible to you immediately is very good in the server-side. But uh, from single page applications, you would have that better as uh, uh, the continuation, like as, as you finish this download and you, you keep interacting with that application, you have a, a good experience. And the main idea of the isomorphic is actually get the best of both. You would rely in the server side rendering to get that very first, uh, first impression, like that, that, that the application is working very fast. But you would also get the single page approach where the navigation after the installation is still very good. So basically, that's only a high level explanation on, on what we are going to, to see today. And from an empty folder now, we are going to write our isomorphic application. You guys can see uh, this is my, my screen right now. As, uh, as you can see, I started with an empty folder and we are going to start from the very, very beginning. So as I said, if, if you have uh, some experience in front-end development, this very beginning will be a bit boring to you. But I think that's, that's a very good way to uh, um, understand from, from, the, from nothing. How can you cr go all the way to a working application? And here we go. Uh, the prerequisites, if you wanted to follow what, what we are going to do here, you mainly need only Node.js installed. Any version after 10 should be fine. And uh, I'm also going to use a TypeScript and Yarn. You can also do everything I'm going to do in normal JavaScript. You don't need a TypeScript for that. But I personally like TypeScript because the code completion and the warnings are, are very valuable. Uh, the main idea that we are going to do as the, the isomorphic part, we, we will have some code running in the server. We will have some coding running in the browser and we have some kind of a reusable co code that will be running in both. So there is a common part that should be unaware of the environment and should sh most of our application should be in that common part to be shared. And the code that is on each individual environment should be almost like a translation layer for the native APIs of those environments to the common code that we have. One example is if you need to know the current URL that you are processing in Node.js, you would rely in a request object to know that. But in the browser, you would rely in the document location to know that. So those are translations from the native uh, um, environments will happen in those entry points for each environment. But the code that we will have in the common area shouldn't be aware of those specific parts for each environment. So the way we can accomplish that is uh, I'm going to create some type of source directory. And inside of this source directory, I will create three subfolders, one to represent each one of those areas, like server, client, and common. So we can start with server, client, and common. OK, so those three folders should be more than enough as a, as a scaffolding for, for the project. We will also uh, create, uh, initialize our yarn and our TypeScript. So yarn is a simple yarn init. I'm not going to worry about any one of those uh, uh, definitions, like how the defaults are fine. And we can also initialize TypeScript. Like the initialization of TypeScript is basically generates the default TS config file. Uh, so I don't have the TypeScript installed in my global environment here. So I'm going to use NPX to run that. But if you have a TypeScript in your global environment, you can run TSC minus minus init. Here I'm going to use NPX with the TypeScript uh, command and with the init option. So this, this generates the default TS config file. The very first target that we are going to, to try here is to have a working HTTP server. So that's the point. So we can start with some kind of index.ts here. We will start installing the basic libraries that we are going to use. So TypeScript. I will also use a TS node 
because uh, I don't want to compile everything, especially the server side, being able to run TypeScript from the command line is very, very simple. And TS node is going to be very important later when we have the browser side. Uh, we are going to use Webpack there. And as we have a TS node, I, I will be able to write the Webpack configuration in TypeScript as well. That's going to simplify a lot our life. Uh, also, something that will be very uh, will be very helpful as we are as we have some Node.js uh, code in the back end, having the types Node already installed will simplify things as well. So I'll start by importing from the HTTP server uh, implementation the native one. So HTTP from HTTP, that's that's the basic HTTP implementation, and we should be able to create a server. And the request represents the object that the browser is sending to us in the server, and the response is the message that I am intending to send back to the browser. So uh, as I get this request response, uh, then we can build this message to send back to the server. So in this case, I'm going to say response right, and we can kind of have a very simple test message here. Not, not doesn't need to, to have anything. This is basically the, the very earlier test of the server. And we also have a response dot end to let the, the uh, HTTP server to know that we finish uh, this message. So it's ready to be sent to the browser. And we are going to listen in a port uh, 8545. And to simplify our life, I'm also going to, to trigger the execution of uh, this, uh, this project via npm script. So I'm going to create a script execution here. That will be my start project. And the only thing I'm going to do is call ts node in the source server folder. We should be good to, to test our first uh, uh, HTTP server. Everything should work fine. So if I do a yarn start and I switch to my browser, I should be able to see a test message in. Yep, it's, uh, means that our first HTTP server is working fine. This is uh, very basic again, so only only to start the process, like uh, nothing really specific for isomorphic yet, but we will get to that point. Uh, the second thing that we, we will need to have is uh, some kind of uh, uh, file library that will be that will be running in the browser side and that's what we are going to have in the client folder so we can start creating the entry point for that i'll call uh, index.ts and again as a very small test only to see if everything works i will start with a console log client so this, this is a very basic console log. My intention to, to confirm a, a, the, if the structure is working fine is we will need to come here to our browser. And in the developer tools, I wanted to see that uh, console log in our log page here. So that's that's the next target that we want to, to go. And that is one of the, the targets that will take uh, a bit longer, longer than the server part, because we will need to generate some kind of uh, bundle from this, this file. Like we will need to compile that into a JavaScript. And then that JavaScript will need to be served to the browser in a, some kind of path. And then that will be able to execute. Uh, normally, if I was using Express, exposing that file to, this, to the browser would be very simple because we could use uh, uh, static middleware and that would work out of the box, but we are not using Express here. So I have some ideas on how we can bypass that limitation. Uh, and I don't want it to really write a middleware manually to serve those files, but uh, we, are, we are going to do some, some tricks here soon. You, you will understand what I mean. Uh, let's start uh, focusing in, in generating the final JavaScript for this entry point. So, as I said, we are going to use a, a Webpack. So we can start by installing Webpack. So yarn add Webpack 
webpack CLI and uh, types webpack. This should be enough to as the installation. Also, we are using TypeScript, so we need a way to tell Webpack how to deal with TypeScript. So I will add uh, a TS loader. And uh, with that, uh, we should be covered. Yeah, not, not, no more libraries. You can see I'm installing some libraries here, but uh, everything I'm installing is supposed to run as in a, as a build tool. The, at the runtime, uh, our only code that we are writing is going to run. So, uh, also, we, now now we are about to create the Webpack configuration file. And as I mentioned before, we are we, because we have the TS node installed. I can write the Webpack configuration file in TypeScript config.ts. And the good point on, on writing that in TypeScript is because I don't really need to remember all the possible configurations that the configuration file has. Like it has a lot of possible configurations. And if we export default object as a configuration, you see that that configuration is pointed as the configuration coming from Webpack. And now that I have this definition, it's very easy to me to come here and start getting like a, a very um, helpful uh, definition of, of what we are going to build. For example, I can say, ah, I want my mode to be in production. And we, we are going to build a production bundle but I don't want that production bundle to be minified because we may may want to inspect that bundle later. But I wanted the tree shaking to happen, the optimizations to happen. So that's why I'm pointing as a production bundle. But if we go to optimizations, I should be able to say uh, minimize false. So then this is going to be a, a, a readable file, but with the optimizations applied. I personally like this type of, of uh, uh, definition. In a real project, you would probably use the web, Webpack dev server to run and watch files for you, all those things. But here we are trying to have something kind of almost in a working state with the basics. So the point is not to see how Webpack works, it's to see isomorphic. So I'm going to create the minimum configuration as possible only to have that working. Uh, also, in, as part of the Webpack, we need to update the entry, like the default entry for Webpack is inside of the source folder, but we have a, we have a client folder there. So we needed to uh, reset the entry. And that means that we are going to point to source client TS. So that's, that's where we are going to start the execution. And we also needed to do some uh, configurations to tell Webpack about a TypeScript specifically. So we needed to update the resolve object to include uh, the extensions. And you can have uh, like a uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, like all the, the extension files that you want uh, Webpack to deal with. As we are writing out the code here, TS is more than enough. Uh, in a real project, this list would have more entries. And in the module part, we also needed to register our, our TS loader to, to tell type, uh, Webpack what to do when they find that TypeScript file. And basically, this is the, everything we need as a, as a TypeScript and Webpack configuration. With this configuration, we should be able to get the index file from the client folder and generate that as a JavaScript that we will be able to serve to the browser later. And to simplify our life again, I will create another script tag in our package.json. And that is going to be something where we are going to run a build process. And the build process only needed to run Webpack with no parameters. This we are able to run Webpack with no parameters because the Webpack configuration file is placed just next to the package JSON, and by default, Webpack will search for the configuration file in that place. So because the Webpack file is there, then we don't need to provide extra parameters, and we should be able to run Yarn build now. If everything is is correct, we should be able to create a final JavaScript file in the default output folder, that is the dist folder. Let's have a look. 
here. Yeah, and as you can see, we just generated this folder here with a main.js file. Uh, we can start inspecting this file to see how it looks like. You can see that the console log that we just created is here. And in, on top of the page of this file, you see that the Webpack runtime is also created here. This is part of the Webpack itself and helps Webpack on understanding the order of the dependencies, what depends on what, what should run first and everything. We only need to transfer this to the browser now. And that's the very next step that we need to, to do. How can we have our HTTP server exposing this file to the browser. Uh, there, as, as we mentioned, there were multiple ways to do. We could have a, a, a specific uh, a check in the request to see if the request is asking for a, that JavaScript file and everything. But I'll do uh, something simpler for now where we are going to, to embed the JavaScript code inside of the HTML. So the, the code that we are going to give to the browser as the HTML page, we already have the JavaScript embedded inside. So I don't need to deal with extra calls to load the JavaScript. And the JavaScript that we are building tends to be really small, so that's not going to be a big deal. For a real application production in the company where you are working, you may not want to do exactly like this, but that that is even, I saw many, many uh, applications using this approach for production. So that shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, what we are going to start doing here is we are going to generate some kind of uh, HTML page. And the way we can do that is by uh, writing HTML here. So the our server is going to generate HTML to send to, to, to the browser. So I can start with uh, HTML. And one trick for WebStorm is as soon as you write some HTML inside of a backticks uh, string, WebStorm kind of identified that this is a, a HTML content. So now all the autocompletes for HTML would work inside of this string and even the Emmet autocomplete. So there is an interesting way to scaffold some um, HTML. Like as soon as, as soon as WebStorm knows that this is a HTML content, then all those autocompletes would work fine. And basically now I can, I don't need to worry about writing this entire content by myself. Okay, so this is the scaffold. Let me delete the extra tags I created here. And we can, let's, let's test this HTML first, only to be sure that it's working. So the way I'm going to test, I'm going to have a header and I write a test. So at least I, I know that the, the appearance of the page should change because of this. And with this, I should be able to do a yarn start. Let's check the page. Originally, we only had that text uh, and with, with no style. And now as I refresh the page, I should receive the HTML. Let's have a look here in the network to confirm what we are receiving. Yeah, and that's the HTML we are receiving from the server. We are going to embed that JavaScript as part of this code. So this code is going to have the script tag. And then inside of this script tag, I want the JavaScript from the other file. The, the way I'm going to do is I'm going to read that file from this execution and embed that code. This is very bad for production environment. Don't do that in a real project. If you are going to read a file like that, you should have the ways to check if the files exist, uh, the security ways to go to the right paths and everything. But again, our intention is to understand how things work. Uh, I'm going to uh, load uh, things from the FS. FS is the file system helper libraries for Node.js. And the, the one I wanted to read is the uh, read file sync. That's the one. So I don't need to worry about uh, callbacks when I read that file. So let's start here in our script. So we should be able to read that file here in the file we want to read. The path I needed to provide is a path going from the root of the project. So we should be able to go to our dist folder and main.js. So what I'm doing here, I'm going to read that file, get the, the JavaScript, and I'm going to print that JavaScript as part of my HTML. 
and this should be good enough to us to test. I will stop start my server uh, here as I load. I now that I reloaded the page, I should have that console log in the page yeah? and here it is we have a console log client let's have a look in the html that we received it's going to be more uh, ugly as we have the html and that entire javascript inside of here and our console log the one part of our application is here that's why now i have this library loaded in the browser we got now to a point a very good moment of, of a slow down and let's let's kind of look on what we have we have the entry point for our back end we have the entry point for our front end and they are well integrated and well working so this is a very good start point this this is basically where we wanted to start now we can actually have some real isomorphic topic. So we may now start creating content into this common folder. The common folder is the part that will be shared into both projects and that should be visible by both. And if you have some experience with React, you probably will see where my inspiration is coming from here. The way I like to, to specify components is by having some kind of a function with a, a name, and normally if you have a react jsx would help you on that but no jsx here we are basically return a string with the content that we want and the way i will originally specify this root component is as a, a div with <coughs> root written inside uh, i will also write in this component i'll do a console log because as this component is part of the shared library this console log should appear in our node.js execution and should also appear in the browser so every time we reload the page we should have that console log twice once in on each environment and i will call this as root component so this this will be very interesting when we run that how, how that is going to work. And we can start integrating this root component in our backend. So to integrate this component, you probably already can see like we are going to call the execution of that component here. Uh, I will create a component here, a div to, to work as a host for this uh, this application. This, this will be very helpful in the front end side as well. I will say, uh, content should be fine and the content i'm going to print here is the root component and i only need to import that if you if we scroll all the way up you will see that this root component it was imported from my common folder now this should should work in the back end side we needed to do something similar for the front end part so the way we we can do that in the front end is now by doing a very similar code and we are going to start this by creating a concept of a, a render function for for some libraries like a react or the, the, this concept of rendering is very common so this is the function i wanted to trigger when i want to uh, re-evaluate the entire uh, tree of components and then reset what the user can see and this render function should be called in the beginning. So as, as the page loads, I want the page to render. And the way we are going to do is we are going to call the document.query selector. So I'm going to query that the component I just created, the content one. And in a very naive way, I'm going to inject the inner HTML as the root component again i needed to uh, import the root component and uh, i know that the content exists so i will kind of uh, ignore that uh, that uh, warning that typescript was giving me 
I will restart. What, something that we will need to start doing now is we need to run the build and the start, not only the, the yarn start, because we changed the things in the front end project. So we needed to rerun that webpack. The way I'm going to do from now on is actually run everything. So I can run build and start all together. Now, as I refresh this page, let's have a look what is going is what is going to happen. Uh, I refresh the page. We, sh we see root component is executed here and root component should also execute here. See, now, now I, I run that code twice, once in the server side, once in the browser side. And let's go here to the network and let's start looking into this, uh, this code here. So as you can see, we generated from the server side, we generate uh, that uh, content with the root there. So the root was already there when when the uh, code uh, when the HTML arrived in the browser. The browser recalculated the same thing and injected the same content in the page again. Yeah. So you can see here the creation of that component and injection in the inner HTML. So everything we just wrote is is running in the browser. And you may be asking yourself, like, if I already have that from the back end, why do I need to do that in the front end again? Like, it's kind of irrelevant. And yes, in this current moment of the project, we are kind of replacing a content to another identical content. But one of the differences that uh, uh, something something the backend cannot do is to inject bindings into that HTML to get uh, the user interactions and activate uh, JavaScript uh, callbacks. So one example is if, imagine you have a, a menu and as you click in that menu, you expand to display a sub menu, something like that. That needs a, a JavaScript binding into that those components. And the backend is not really going to be able to inject that correctly. So we are going to have some content coming from the backend that has almost a, has no binding at all. And we are going to recreate that HTML that looks identical, but now it has bindings and has the HTML triggers and we swap them. And then as we swap them, then the page becomes interactive. So until that swap happens, the pages there is visible, but um, things that you are going to do are probably not going to work or or they are not going to be as uh, with a good experience as if you have your JavaScript and now your bindings created correctly. So that's why this swap is important because of the potential uh, enhancements that you can do in the HTML. And this process in the isomorphic world is normally called hydration. So getting a original HTML content that came from the server and taking control of that to, to enhance that, that code is what people call as hydration. Uh, different libraries have different approaches for this hydration. One example is React tends to be to do a smart hydration on uh, keeping the elements in the page the same and only enhancing the, the elements that are already there. In things like uh, uh, Angular 2, they would do a full page refresh anyway, similar to what we are doing here. But again, this, this concept is very interesting because if you go to work with uh, Angular 2 or React in the isomorphic part, that's, that works identical. The, the same process works exactly the same way. Uh, okay, so we have uh, now this component shared and running and that is visible into both areas. Uh, you can see the, the root component is there. But uh, one, one main process that uh, uh, isomorphic pages would uh, uh, need to have uh, to be called isomorphic is the concept of a single page application. As you finish the hydration, that becomes a single page application. And the single page application means that you could navigate between sub pages in this app without actually triggering a new network call or a full page reload. So if we navigate right now for, for so other pages, that would trigger a, a, a full page reload. So we needed to start dealing with this possibility of navigating without having the real, uh, nav the, re the real browser navigation. And to start that, let's actually create a, some concept of sub pages. Like we can create a menu with uh, some links. We can start uh, navigating between pages and then we enhance that experience to be single page. 
let's see how the the way I, I think it's simpler to do it like we can create a, some concept of a, a menu component normally the hydration uh, should happen uh, faster than the users can actually interact with the page so uh, for example if you imagine a new website you access the website and your attention will probably first go into reading the content or the user would not really click on things or interact with the page uh, in the very beginning. It's more like a reading the page. And then you will still have that time to hydrate and to enhance the page behind the scenes. So uh, the point is, the we are talking about here like saving like a less than a second to the, to the page. So if you display a loading animation for one second, and then you show a full page that is completely interactive, comparing that with showing a no interactive page, but without the content there for one second and then enhancing that page, the second option tends to be better for the experience and for the engagement of the user. So it's, it's less likely that the users will get annoyed with your page and navigate away to somewhere else. Uh, when you click in a, in a link to navigate to another page, we will have a link that works even if you disable JavaScript. So that's why even browsers that have no JavaScript engine, they should be able to work or at least have something visible to the user and some interactions available. It's not going to be the same as the full JavaScript, but it's better than nothing. And as the browsers give more features, then that experience will be better and better. Okay, so the menu component that we are going to have, so we can export a function menu and that will work similar to the other components. I will return a string and this string will represent the menu that we are building. So I'll have here a list and this list will have some items. And then here, here is the part where I mentioned like, we will have uh, links that are real HTML links that can navigate from one page to another. And the first link we can have is like something to go like to a home page. We may create a, um, a, smart, a different component, abstracting only the link part as another component later. Then we can make some, some things smarter like, uh, uh, having some style for the one that is selected. Like we, we are going to, to make this as realistic as possible in page three. I have my menu and I will inject this menu in my root object here. So I can remove this and I can inject the menu. Okay, so and that should import menu from common. That's it. With a quick stop start, we should now see that uh, page with a uh, uh, navigation. And here we should have our menu. So yeah, that's good. So now I should be able to click uh, in this link and navigate between pages. And if you see the URL, you will see that I am actually navigating between pages. That, that's a real, and that is triggering a real request to page three in the URL. So you see like I'm calling like slash page three and that page three is returning the same page. This is returning the same page because our HTTP server only knows how to return this page. There is no variation by path yet. We are going to introduce that soon. But so far I'm, I'm having this navigation and this is happening in as a full page reload. That's just the way that server-side rendered applications work is as a sending a request to the server, server is processing, returning back to me. Now to transform these or to intercept those requests and transform them into a single page application style, we will need to intercept that and deal in the JavaScript side with uh, stopping the original request from happening, dealing with updating the URL up there, and then doing a new re-rendering of the application. So the, the content of the page would be affected with that, uh, that part. That's what we are going to do to now. The, the, way, the way we can confirm our next target is by clicking in those links and not having any extra network calls here. 
So right now, as I click in those links, you will see that I have the full page reload and that the changes and generate an extra network calls. I wanted to click in those links. I wanted the URL to be affected, the page to re-render, but no extra calls. And to do that, we will need to improve our front end library to have a concept like we will need to be able to trigger some kind of JavaScript function to deal with this navigation for us. So from intercepting the navigation, stopping the default execution and re-rendering the page in the real path. And I think a simple, simple way to call that function is kind of having like a go function that I provided the URL that I want to go. So that URL will be a string. And I should also receive some kind of event. This event will be important because we will need to prevent the default execution of this event. So the browser doesn't really navigate to the other page. That will make sense. I will make the event optional because then if I'm, I'm calling this function manually, not from an event, uh, from a button or anything, I still can use that function. And as I said, the, the main point of this function, we are going to check when the event exists, I wanted to prevent the default execution. So you see, prevent the default, only if that exists. I will need to update the URL on top of the page, like artificially update that URL without a full page refresh. That happens by the history.push state API. Push state API is a native browser API, so our browsers support that. And after you do that, like after you stop the original execution, you update the browser, we would want we would need to re-render the page again. And that's our go function. We will need to call this function from our own click event from those links. So the links that we just created here. Now we need to, to generate an on click that will call the go function. The idea is on click, I may call go. And in this first button, this is the, the button that goes to the home path. So I'll go to the slash and I will provide the event as a parameter. For context, every time you have some event like this, this uh, code here works as like evaluation of this code. So basically this code is going to be executed as we click in this button. And this evaluation of this code runs with uh, some values are read as part of the context. So event there is one of those values that are read exist as part of the context where this evaluation happens. And this event represents the event of the click. So that's why we need to, to send that event to the go function. And then the go function will be able to do the prevent default. So now we can include this go function in the other calls. We will also need to update some things in our webpack because the go function was actually created as part of a, a module and webpack will kind of encapsulate that function inside of the module. So the function is not actually visible to us to call like this. Like when we do that on click, this, this execution will try to find the go function inside of the global scope. That would be the window object. And that the, the go function is not going to be there. I will run that like this to, 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 to represent what, what the problem means. And then I'll show how to resolve that in a simple webpack configuration. So. Yeah, so now I reloaded the page. Let's go to the console. And as I click in one of those links, things will break. And as you see, yeah, you probably saw that blinking uh, an error message here very quickly. So basically that is that means I'm trying to call a go function, but that go function doesn't exist. And I will show you why that function doesn't exist is if we go in, into the script that was created here in the browser, and you will see that the go function was created as part of our module. So you see here, this, here is the go function. And this go function was created inside of this module here, this webpack module. So it's inside of this other function that represents the module. So you cannot really access this go function yet from something like a window.go. 
that that is not going to work because the window.go doesn't exist. So we needed to kind of expose those functions, the render, the go, and any other thing to be available in the global scope so we can call them from anywhere. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm talking about. So the way we can do that is in our entry point for our browser here, we need to uh, export those functions. So I will export the go function and the render function for now. That should be enough. And I'm also going to create a very uh, updated Webpack configuration only to include uh, extra information to tell that Webpack that whatever is exported from my entry point should be copied to the global scope. So the way we do that is by having an output. So the output is, has uh, general configurations about how the output would work. And here we can set up a library target. When we set a library target to global, means we are building a library that should be visible in the global scope. And that's it. Now our Go function should be visible to anywhere in the application to call, even outside of the Webpack modules. Uh, let's see how things go. I will do a full page refresh. Now, if I click on page three, let's see. Oh, you see here, page three updated in the browser. So I can now click into multiple pages. You see that the root component is getting called. So I, I am re-rendering the page in the browser. And if I go back to the network and I click the and I clean up the network calls, I will start navigating here, and you will see that the only thing I'm I'm getting updated there is the fa favorite icon. That icon is like the browser is trying to find an icon to display here in the title. Uh, we may remove that that call later to to reduce the noise, but at least the page itself we are not calling. Like now we have a single page application here. This this is a navigation happening only in the JavaScript part that affects the, the URL and re-renders the page. But as you probably can see, like it's still a bit harder to see that navigation happening because all those pages, they look identical. Like they all have only the menu. There's nothing else. Uh, uh, no title or nothing, no difference in those pages. So my next target is to make those pages different enough. So when I have that navigation, we'll be able to see them better. And the best way to do that is we will start having like some concept of routing, similar to React. If you if you worked with React Router in the past, like you may have some components that needs to match to a URL. So depending on that matching, you render something or something else. So that's that's the kind of idea that I have uh, right now. And to be able to have uh, this routing, we will need to have access to the URL. Like we, we will need to know where or what we are trying to render inside of the root component. So let's go back here. So our root component will need to somehow know the URL. And that's that's what I mentioned before. Like it's kind of hard to the root component to know that because if this code is going to run in node and in browser, the ways to discover the URL is different on each one of those platforms. So we will need to create some extra code in those two entry points for browser and server to provide the URL to the root component. Uh, let's start with the index because the index is, is probably going to be a bit simpler. So uh, you probably remember I mentioned that the request is the representation of the message that the browser sends to the server. So inside of the request object, there is a field that is called URL. And that field is the, is the intention is to tell the server what we are looking for in the server. Uh, this URL is going to be the complete URL with the parameters, like uh, the attributes, parameters, everything, like the, the full URL. Right now, I'm interested only in the path the path name of, of that. So the, the simplest way to deal with that is to use a, a native Node.js uh, parser. So we can get the URL from URL. And we can use this to parse the URL for us. So I can do a URL dot parse. And that is going to provide that for us. 
And here it's saying that the URL may be no. I know in this project that that's not the case, so I will kind of ignore that error. If you are in a real project, don't ignore the error and actually provide a ways to deal with that. In this parse, we return a complex object with a lot of information inside. I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not interested on, on everything in that object, so I'm going to uh, only pick what I need, that is the path name. So that's the only thing I need. And we can use this path name and we can call the root component providing the path name to the root component. So now now we are giving that uh, that awareness to the root component. The root component doesn't really need to know where the path name came from, only needs to know that, that it exists and needs to deal with that. So we can update our root component to receive this path. And that is going to be a string. And because I updated the root component, that will uh, fail the build of the browser part because the browser also needs to provide that. The way that the browser uh, will get the path name is by using the document dot location and document dot location is also a complex object that has all the path related things but i'm not interested on that so i'm only interested in one part so i can do a very similar uh code where i also destructure that object get only the path name and i provide the path name to my root object so then now you can see that uh basically the the root object as a reusable library doesn't need to know where that, that path comes from, only will use that path name internally. And to confirm if everything is working, I'm going to print this menu and I will print just next to the menu the path name itself. So we will be able to, to, to see something changing in the page as we navigate from one page to another, something will be affected there. So here I can display the path. Ah, yeah, path name. So that means that path name may be um, no, and I don't care about that. I know it's not going to be. So because of, because we have a very controlled environment, I know that path name is not going to be no. Uh, okay, so we should be able to see the page updating now with uh, the path here. And yes, we can see this. So as I navigate now from one page to another, you see that that path affects there. And that is a really good thing to, to see. Like we, we, if I force the full page refresh, that will load the page tree from the server. And you see that the page tree was created as part of that page. But from this point in time, I will be able to navigate to other pages like page two. And I don't have another network call. I, nothing, nothing needed to go to the server. If I force the refresh of the page, yes, I call the page two from the server and the page two will be created. This is an interesting point. I'm going to now disable my JavaScript and you will see that uh, the application still works. Like uh, everything should still be fine, but uh, without uh, the JavaScript enhancements. So I will do a full page refresh. Now we go back to the point where the JavaScript doesn't exist, but you see, page three, page one, home. So pages is still working. It's working in a slightly less ideal way, but works. And then as the browsers of the users provide features and JavaScript and everything, the, the difference for them is that the experience will be better. So it will be faster or will be uh, smoother for the users, but uh, they are not really getting much features than everyone else. And now with, with this, I reloaded the page and now I can have that same navigation, the same feeling should be there. All good. So let's see. I think we can now go into that uh, uh, routing system. So the idea is we should have uh, some more complex page for each one of those pages, like home, uh, page one, page two, page three. Let's have uh, some more complicated page. And then as we have a navigation between them, that's going to be a more realistic uh, uh, application. So let's start here. So we can 
create a new component. I'll create like a home component. This home component will be a very simple and that will return uh, and the main thing I would say here is home so because I don't have a much else to say so as we can uh, uh, navigate between pages like if we see that a title changing that's going to represent that the things are working fine and what I'm going to do I will duplicate this component as well so I will get uh, the page one page one component I also needed to rename the function and the title so here we go, page one. And uh, now I can duplicate this page to page two, page three, page four, or whatever. Page two, I will rename the function and the title. Uh, we will need to, the, the root component is still going to be uh, uh, the entry point for everything. And that's where we are going to uh, to have our routing definitions there. The the page, our pages will have us that menu anyway. So that's part of the main template of the page. And uh, we can remove this log now. Let's start defining our routing. So I'll create a const routes that would be a key value pair these routes could be outside of this function that's probably going to be better if create outside and the idea is i'm going to create something like the simplest way possible the key of this object will be the path itself the path that i want to match and the value will be the object that i wanted to execute so when the path is only a slash that is the home so, and I don't want to execute this here. I only, on, only want the function here. If I have a path slash page one, then I want the page one component. And now we have our, our routes set. So we can use, ah, we should have some type of uh, uh, default route if we have like a, if we try to access a page that doesn't exist. Uh, I'll, I'll give a message like page not found or page doesn't exist. That would be interesting. So I'll call here not uh, found. Yep. So we will also need to register data here uh, in our routing. So if we if we try to access something that we don't uh, don't uh, uh, recognize, we can switch to this. Uh, error page and of course if we access from the browser slash error we also load the error page so both will be fine uh, here it is so now we have the path the idea is that we may get uh, uh, the page handler or the page component uh, will be what we are going to get in the routes in the path and we can say if we, if we don't find anything, then give me routes error. Uh, we would get that uh, path component and we execute that and that should display. So now we don't display the URL anymore. We only display the execution of that path. You are saying that this object here has implicit any because the TypeScript default object has a strict mode. So we should specify that this object has a key string and value is a function. So it's a function that returns a string. With that definition, things should be fine. Yeah. See now, and I actually, because I did that uh, via like the, the error handling in the same line, I, this actually doesn't need to be a let, we can have that as a const. And I'll refresh this page and we have a home page. 
And as we have a home page now, I should be able to navigate between multiple pages. And you see the only network traffic we have is that a favorite icon. No extras are called. But if I manually go to a page that doesn't exist, we have not found. So I think we are kind of in a very interesting uh, point of cut now for, for this first live stream today. We have a working application. Uh, we can navigate between pages. We have a data uh, front end hydrating the page and taking care of uh, the single page aspects. Also having the back end uh, working fine. Even if we disable JavaScript, you are, we are able to do the full, full page reload. And from the user's perspective, having JavaScript or not in this application becomes irrelevant. That that works anyway in both with or without. Uh, we I will post this uh, this project in GitHub. Uh, that is going to be where we are going to pick up next week from this point. And again, thank you for being here, everyone. I think it was a great uh, first uh, stream. I'm very happy on how that uh, that uh, went. Uh, I hope next week uh, we can have uh, more people. So share the link with uh, with everyone. Uh, the video offline should also be helpful on, on sharing that. And the next uh, the next uh, things we are going to build in this application is trying to have uh, that as a more realistic app, like maybe create, update, and delete, uh, calling some REST APIs, having some some kind of a more interactive uh, application. Uh, today was very very setting up the project. So and that's yeah i see some comments in the chat thank you everyone i th i will assume you have uh, no questions or, or or things right now but uh, if you have a uh, later write in the comments the main point of uh, of the live stream will be youtube so ideally if you can go to the youtube page and write your comments there will be simpler but any of any one of the other platforms is also welcoming uh, and I will probably stop from here now if uh, you guys don't have uh, other questions. Final thank you. See you guys. Bye.